Good evening, everyone. I'm Jackie Dominguez, one of ALF's National Directors of Engagement. On behalf of the American Liver Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining the second installation of the Northern California Medical Advisory Council Enrichment Series. The title of tonight's program is Health Disparities in Liver Disease, a focus on women's health. Tonight's program will be recorded for future viewing. Your acknowledgement of this fact was obtained during the registration process. However, we feel it's important to mention this prior to the start of the program. As a reminder, the mission of the American Liver Foundation is to promote education, advocacy, support services, and research for the prevention, treatment, and cure of liver disease. As a not-for-profit, organization, we rely on the generosity of our stakeholders and hope that you might make a donation so we can continue to fulfill our mission. You may not be aware of all the resources ALF has to offer, and I encourage everyone to visit our website. There you will find upcoming educational programming for healthcare professionals, patients, and events, such as our upcoming 45th anniversary gala on October 21st. I believe we've all become proficient Zoom users over the past year. A few reminders, please keep your camera off and audio muted to prevent distractions. And it would be appreciated if you could put your questions in the chat function so they can be answered after the presentations. Our moderators will keep an eye on the chat during the presentations. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize our sponsors for this evening, Intercept and Salix. Intercept is being represented by Wes Wilhite, and Salix is being represented by Alyssa Cal Calab Calabrigo, sorry, Alyssa, and Erica Austin. After the meeting, we will forward the representative's name and contact information to all of our guests. Please remember to thank them for their support when you visit with them. It is now my pleasure to thank our local Medical Advisory Council co-chairs for their continued leadership. Please join me in thanking Dr. Courtney Sherman and welcoming Dr. Jennifer Guy, who will say a few words about the Medical Advisory Council and introduce our MCs for the evening. Hello, everyone, and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are just really thrilled to have you here and to be talking about such an important topic with this enrichment series. Um, on the slide are the numbers of the Northern California Medical Advisory Council. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of them for their tireless work on behalf of patients and providers. Um, ultimately, we all really care about what um, we can offer patients in terms of advocacy and education. And that's what this group uh, really focuses on. So thank you for uh, engaging with us um, as we do this work. Two of our math members who have been instrumental in putting together this enrichment series are Dr. Nizar Mita, who's from Kaiser Permanente, and Dr. Titus Gamam from California Civic Medical Center. We are so grateful for their leadership in bringing these important topics to you, and this is our second in the enrichment series. Um, and we also would like to thank Courtney Sherman, who is not with us tonight, but is on the um, planning committee, as well as Deepak Sarkar. So I'll turn this over to Nizar. Take it away. Thank you, Nizar. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you all for attending today. Um, you know, really, when the um, our uh, local MAC here met to discuss what our enrichment series should be focused on, it was at a time when there was really widespread, you know, social outcry for um, a movement towards social justice and equity, really on all levels of of our lives, and. We thought it was an opportune time to really kind of focus a lens on disparities, um, health disparities, and in particular health disparities in liver disease. And so um, it's really with that motivation in mind that we put together these series um, in large part, not only to you know, help us all learn about the health disparities in liver disease, but allow us to network and learn from each other's experiences and you know, really um, establish collaborations for um, research on the local and national level um, to help advance this area. Um, and so uh, I think for those of you who attended a few months ago, we had uh, Dr. Lewis Roberts from Mayo Clinic um, and, and, um, and John Roberts here from uh, uh, 
uh, sorry, Robert Wong, sorry, from uh, Stanford here, um, talk on uh, liver disparities as a whole and liver disparities and health disparities in liver cancer. Um, and so uh, today's talk is really uh, focused on uh, women's health in liver disease. And uh, I'm really, uh, we have fantastic speakers lined up and I'm really honored to introduce um, our first speaker who's Dr. Carla Brady. Um, she's uh, Dr. Brady's an associate professor at the Division of Gastroenterology at Duke University Medical Center. She's been a member of their faculty since 2006. She graduated from the University of Virginia School of Medicine uh, before completing internal medicine and GI training at MCP Hanneman University in Philadelphia. Um, she earned a master's of, of clinical research through Duke University um, and serves as a transplant hepatologist there with an interest in liver disease and liver transplantation with a focus on women's health. Um, Dr. Brady is the author of various manuscripts on liver disease in pregnancy and liver disease in menopause. She's given numerous talks locally, regionally, nationally on liver disease in pregnancy, pregnancy and transplant patients and liver disease and liver transplantation in menopausal women. She's an active member of the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases. She's served on its scientific program committee and nominating committee. She's also served as a previous chair of the ASLD program evaluation committee and is the current chair of the AAS AASLD inclusion and diversity committee. I had the honor of working under her leadership, um, which was tremendous. Um, locally um, at, at Duke, she's uh, an elected member of the executive committee of the academic council of Duke University. And she previously served as a steering committee member for the Duke University Academic Council Diversity Task Force and as co-chair of its subcommittee on best practices in faculty and administrative diversity. Um, she enjoys jazz music and spending time with her family. Um, uh, truly, we're honored to have you here today, um, uh, Dr. Brady. Uh, you're uh, a mentor uh, of mine and uh, someone whose career I, I aspire to emulate. And uh, we're really just thrilled to have you and to learn from you today. Turn it over to Kedist. Sure. Um, I second Dr. Mukhtar's comment about the importance of this program, and we're so fortunate to have the support from ALF, uh, the MAC members, as well as our co-chairs. And I uh, do thank our great speakers today who are here to share their um, experiences, um, research, and insight about women's health and liver diseases. My great pleasure to introduce our um, first to speak of our one of our speakers, Dr. Monica Sarka from UCSF um, Hepatology. Dr. Sarka will be talking about um, healthcare disparities in liver diseases, mostly focusing on sex disparities in transplant and transplant outcomes. Dr. Sarka is again a transplant hepatologist at UCSF with a focus on reproductive. Um, health and liver disease in general in women. She runs a dedicated women's health clinic at UCSF um, addressing contraception and pregnancy-related management in the context of uh, chronic liver disease at different stages, as well as um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease management in unique patient populations, such as our young women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, she um, has an NIH funding for research that evaluates the contribution of sex hormones and natural progression in women. She's been recognized at national and international um, stage and selected as a leader in the inaugural ASLD guidance document on repro reproductive health and liver disease. She currently serves as the chair of the ASLD Women's Initiative Committee, which I had the great pleasure to work with her in the last three years. This committee really aims for um, encouraging and promoting education surrounding reproductive health overall and liver disease, and also um, putting a lot of effort in um, career advancement and women and hepatology. Um, I just want to remind our attendees before we uh, start out with our presentations that uh, will be our speakers will be taking questions at the end of Bell's presentations. Uh, please make sure that you do send your questions via the chat box. Um, at the end of Bell's talks, uh, myself as well as Dr. Mukhtar will help mediate the discussion. With that, I will turn the stage to Dr. Carla Brady 
who will be talking about health disparities and liver diseases with a focus on uh, women's health. Uh, Dr. Carla. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. Um, I am going to talk about, uh, focus mainly on chronic liver diseases um, and uh, from a women's health perspective and look at disparities that we see amongst those. Um, I have no disclosures um, for this presentation. Um, and as I get going, um, I would like to, first of all, talk about uh, determinants of health um, and just briefly mention um, this because this really ties into our understanding about health disparities. The World Health Organization identifies these seven factors, as you can see on the screen, as factors that influence health outcomes. For the purposes of today's talk, we're gonna focus mainly on gender or sex as I have included in the italicized text, um, I added sex um, there because it was only gender listed um, because there's actually a difference between gender and sex. Gender as we know it is a socially constructed role that is based on behaviors and expressions, whereas sex refers to biological attributes, including chromosomes, gene expression, hormone levels and reproductive anatomy. And it's very important to understand the difference between the two when you're talking um, about women's health related issues. In order to discuss women's health issues, it's important to think about the health of women across the spectrum of their lives, spanning their reproductive years um, across into menopause. A number of biological changes occur across this spectrum that influence the risk for an expression of various disease states. A key biologic issue that influences um, the risk for an expression of liver disease is estrogen. Um, estrogen has a number of beneficial roles in the body. Um, within the context of liver disease, estrogen has been shown to inhibit fibrinogenesis, protect mitochondrial structure and function, and inhibit cell senescence. Estrogen has also been shown to promote antioxidant effects and it can increase innate immunity. These functions have been shown to impact risk for and severity of various liver diseases. For today, we will look at women's health related disparities among three common liver diseases, alcohol associated liver disease, hepatitis C and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. First, let's look at alcohol-associated liver disease. Alcohol-associated liver disease can present in different forms from hepatic steatosis to acute alcoholic hepatitis and cirrhosis. It is the cause of nearly one half of liver-related um, deaths in the US and costs for alcohol-associated cirrhosis represent over one half of total costs for cirrhosis. It is an increasing indication for liver transplantation. And as I have told many patients whom I've cared for with this disorder, ongoing alcohol use is the strongest predictor of death, especially in alcoholic hepatitis. Therefore, it is critically important that our patients discontinue alcohol consumption. Sex and gender influence the expression and outcomes of alcohol-associated liver disease. Women are known to be more susceptible to the negative effects of alcohol on the liver. Women are disproportionately affected by alcohol use disorder. And those who develop alcohol-associated liver disease have a more rapid progression to fibrosis. Compared to men, Women are observed to develop higher blood ethanol concentrations at comparable amounts of consumed alcohol. This is thought to be due to decreased body water content in women, leading to a smaller volume of distribution, as well as reduced gastric alcohol dehydrogenase that leads to impaired first pass metabolism. There are also sex related differences in alcohol metabolism due to lower levels of hepatic enzymes in women. Additionally, there are sex-related differences in how hepatic inflammation develops in alcohol-associated liver disease. 
noting that higher endotoxin levels in women, along with estrogen-driven activation of Kupfer cells, contribute to a greater likelihood of inflammation in the liver. Gender disparities can also be seen with alcohol use disorder. Behavior modification in various FDA-approved pharmacologic therapies have been shown to have modest benefit in alcohol use disorder. Interestingly, utilization of these therapies in the general U.S. population is low, and those who seek such therapies tend to be older, male, and with longer substance abuse history and with mood disorders. Women are more likely to have histories that would influence risk for alcohol use disorder, such as family or spouse history of this disorder, a history of being raised in a vulnerable environment, and a family history of depression. Women are less likely to seek any type of treatment for alcohol use disorder, and many treatment barriers um, that they report include social stigma, attitudinal barriers, financial concerns, and competing family and or childcare responsibilities. So what about gender disparity in alcohol use disorder specifically among patients with alcohol-associated liver disease? A more recent study looked at this issue specifically among over 60,000 insured patients with alcohol-associated cirrhosis. Within this cohort, 32% were women, and the majority of patients had insurance coverage that would have allowed for behavior modification and or pharmacological therapy for alcohol use disorder. Interestingly, only 1.2% used an FDA approved alcohol relapse drug and only 14.5% attended mental health and substance abuse visits two years after a diagnosis of cirrhosis. As you can see from the bar graph, women as represented by the light gray bars were significantly less likely than men represented in the dark gray bars to attend clinic visits and use alcohol relapse medications. As a result of the earlier data on sex differences in this disorder, AASLD guidance on alcohol associated liver disease has stated that safe levels of alcohol use for men without liver disease would be no more than two standard drinks per 24 hours Whereas in men, this should, excuse me, whereas in women, this should be no more than one standard drink per 24 hours. And for patients with liver disease, there's no safe level of drinking and thus they should abstain from drinking altogether. Now let's look at hepatitis C. About 2.4 million people in the US have hepatitis C infection. An increase in the number of new hepatitis C cases was seen between 2009 and 2014, which was thought to be related to injection drug use, noting that women of reproductive age at that time accounted for about half of young persons who injected drugs. About 75% to 85% of persons newly infected with hepatitis C develop chronic infection and among those with chronic infection, about 10 to 20% develop cirrhosis. Once cirrhotic, there is about a three to 6% annual risk of hepatic decompensation and about a one to 4% risk per year of hepatocellular carcinoma. There has been a recent rise in the number of acute hepatitis C cases, which increased by 3.4 fold across 2006 to 2014. In this cohort, over half of cases were seen in non-Hispanic white women. This slide depicts the observed upward trend in acute hepatitis C cases in the United States. As you can see from this graph, the rates of reported acute hepatitis C cases rose in women in the early 2000s to rates similar to what was seen in men. By 2011, the rates in men began to exceed the rates in women again, but overall rates have risen in both subpopulations. And this graph depicts the interesting trend in which the number of hepatitis C cases in younger women began to exceed the number of hepatitis C cases seen in older women, with the increase in injection drug use in young women contributing to this observation. These younger women are of childbearing age, which means that there is great importance to assessing for hepatitis C infection in younger women. What do we know about hepatitis C infection in pregnant women? About 8% of pregnant women worldwide 
are thought to be infected with hepatitis C. And within the US, about one to 2.5% of women are infected with hepatitis C who are pregnant. Overall, there is about a five to 6% risk of mother to child transmission of hepatitis C. Because there is risk of mother to child transmission, and because of increasing rates of hepatitis C in childbearing women, it is critically important for women to undergo screening for hepatitis C. In 2020, hepatitis C recommendations broadened to include recommendations for testing of all adults aged 18 to 79 years. Um, these all adults in this age range should undergo at least one time screening for hepatitis C infection. And more specifically, there should be hepatitis C screening in all pregnant women during every pregnancy. So what about sex and gender differences in the natural history of hepatitis C? Data have led to observations of slower hepatic fibrosis in women compared to men, and that the progression of fibrosis is not linear with advancing age. The data suggests that the rate of fibrosis progression in women may be faster in older age than in younger age. Earlier data have reported lower rates of tobacco use and a lower likelihood of iron overload as a contributor to potential liver injury. An earlier study from France looked at rates of fibrosis progression in women according to various stages of life and conditions in which health would be influenced by estrogen levels. From this study, it was observed that a nulliparous state or a state of never having been pregnant and menopause were independent predictors of fibrosis progression in women with hepatitis C infection. And additional data from this study um, shown on the screen in women with hepatitis C have demonstrated that menopause is associated with more advanced levels of fibrosis. In this study of 251 women with hepatitis C, 122 women were postmenopausal and 65 of the postmenopausal women received hormone replacement therapy. Although postmenopausal women were more likely to have progression to advanced fibrosis, postmenopausal women taking hormone therapy were less likely to have progression to advanced fibrosis. Thankfully, we have multiple very effective therapies for hepatitis C infection that now clear infection in greater than 90% of patients are of short duration and with few side effects. We do not have enough safety data quite yet to support a, rep or excuse me, a recommendation for hepatitis C treatment in pregnant women, but this underscores the importance of hepatitis C screening in women of childbearing age. Regarding hepatitis C treatment outcomes, existing data have suggested that sustained virological response with hepatitis C therapy may be associated with important outcomes, including lowered risk for, for uh, diabetes mellitus, acute coronary syndrome, ischemic stroke, and in-stage renal disease in patients with pre-existing diabetes. We know from data outside of the hepatolo hepatology realm that the risk of cardiovascular disease increases in postmenopausal women and that women of older age, meaning older than 60 years, have higher rates of cardiovascular disease than men. Interestingly, chronic kidney disease without end-stage renal disease is actually more common in women. Women are less likely to start dialysis and more likely to die in the pre-dialysis period of chronic kidney disease. With these gender differences in cardiovascular and kidney disease and earlier observations of sustained virological response, lowering the likelihood of these endpoints in hepatitis C infected patients, it is important to understand if there are gender differences in how sustained virological response might impact these comorbid conditions. Newer data just recently published earlier this year identified a reduced risk of acute coronary syndrome in stage renal disease and ischemic stroke in hepatitis C patients who achieved sustained virological response with treatment. This risk was particularly significant in female patients compared to male patients. 
Interestingly, the lowered risk for acute coronary syndrome is particularly significant for female patients who achieved SVR on interferon-based therapy compared to male patients who achieved SVR on interferon-based therapy or direct acting antiviral therapy. The reasons for this are not yet clear and deserve further investigation. What was also noted in this study is the observation of female patients with interferon treatment failure having a marked increase risk of cardiovascular and kidney disease. These data highlight the importance of diagnosing and treating women infected with hepatitis C. So now let's look at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is now thought to be the most common liver disease and thought to be seen in about 25% of the global population. It is associated with obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, and polycystic ovarian syndrome. It can progress to advanced liver disease and represents the third most common cause of hepatocellular carcinoma. It is the second most common indication for liver transplantation. The most common cause of death in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is cardiovascular disease. The prevalence of NAFLD is lower in women than in men. However, among those with NAFLD, women are as likely as men to have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. And among older patients, women are 37% more likely than men to have advanced fibrosis. This is concerning in that severe fibrosis predicts increased liver-related mortality in NASH patients. Data have demonstrated that among NAFLD patients, fibrosis severity is greater in men than in premenopausal women, but occurs at the same rate in postmenopausal women with NAFLD. Data have shown that postmenopausal women are at an increased risk for development of NASH and at advanced stages of fibrosis, it is believed that contributors to this include observations of decreased energy expenditure, increased visceral fat with increased body weight, and greater likelihood of development of dyslipidemia in women who reach menopause. These changes in subsequent development of more severe fatty liver disease in postmenopausal women are likely related to estrogen loss and age-related changes that lead to increases in pro-inflammatory cytokines. As we continue on the theme of liver disease across the spectrum of women's health, we will turn briefly to a few notes about fatty liver disease in women. Obesity affects about one third of women of childbearing age in Western countries, and these obese pregnant women are at risk for preeclampsia and gestational diabetes. The metabolic milieu of pregnancy is altered with increases in triglyceride and cholesterol levels across pregnancy, as well as increases in free fatty acids, leading to decreased ability of insulin to suppress lipolysis. Just as NAFLD is of increasing importance as women age, there's also concern about metabolic disturbance in pregnancy as it relates to NAFLD risk. For women who develop gestational diabetes, they are at risk for subsequent development of type two diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. And we also see that gestational diabetes is a marker of early atherosclerosis and of development of NAFLD later in life. Thus, for pregnant women who are presenting with obesity, it is critically important that they undergo metabolic assessments and monitoring postpartum in order to ensure that there is not progression of metabolic disturbances in the postpartum period. Furthermore, if there are opportunities to make these assessments prior to pregnancy, even in women without known obesity, diabetes, or history of preeclampsia, this may offer opportunities for interventions that may help to improve metabolic health prior to either a first or subsequent pregnancies. The incidence of NAFLD in women of childbearing age is thought to be about 10%, and it is thought that NAFLD in pregnancy increases risk for C-section, preterm birth, preeclampsia, and low birth weight. So it is a significant comorbidity in pregnancy. 
Multiple interventions for NAFLD have been studied and numerous clinical trials have been underway to assess for possible pharmacologic interventions. For now, the main intervention that has been associated with success is lifestyle intervention with weight loss, noting that weight loss of three to 5% has been associated with improvement in steatosis and weight loss of up to seven to 10% has been shown to improve hepatic inflammation and fibrosis. For the sake of time, I will not review the other therapies on this slide, um, but it is noted that there are many that have been studied and more that will hopefully come down the pike. And with that, I will conclude um, and um, let our moderator and next speaker talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Brady. I don't know if you guys can see me. Um, I don't see myself, um, but um, uh, thank you so much. That was really informative. I learned a lot actually, and really quite um, uh, surprised by some of the numbers you, you mentioned that up to 10% you know, of, of women can um, during pregnancy may have hepatitis C. Um, and 10% um, may also have uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I mean, really striking numbers, one in 10 patients. Um, and then really a lot of questions about, you know, what the role of estrogen is um, in, in preventing liver disease progression in women. I'm quite curious to hear um, your thoughts about estrogen replacement therapy um, during the Q&A session. Um, but um, before that, um, I'd like to uh, just introduce again, Dr. Sarkar, um, and turn it over to her to give us a talk about um, health disparities in liver transplant from a, a woman's health um, focus. Um, and um, uh, again, you know, just to echo uh, uh, Kiddis' remarks, I'm really just an honor to have you here today, Dr. Sarkar, another uh, mentor uh, to me and someone who um, I really admire and, and really um, appreciate um, the, the guidance and leadership you've shown um, uh, for, for us, um, for me as one of your trainees and then as a, a, a young faculty. So thank you so much. All right, well, thank you, Nazar, for that kind introduction. And I am delighted to talk tonight about sex disparities in liver transplant. And I have no relevant disclosures. So we'll start with a case of a 55-year-old Asian woman who's admitted with newly decompensated hepatitis B cirrhosis. She's listed with a MELD score of 34, blood type O, and she's five feet tall, or 152 centimeters. A week after listing, she progresses to multi-organ failure. She requires intubation and presser support, and she's ultimately delisted as being too sick for transplant nine days after her initial listing. So of note, two offers were declined prior to her ultimate deactivation on the transplant wait list. Now, where I practice um, in the Bay Area, this is not an uncommon event um, where we have challenges in getting our sick patients um, to transplant in a very high meld competitive region. Though I anticipate that wherever you practice, you've experienced the challenges of achieving liver transplant for your female population as well. So before we talk about our reliance on the MELD system for organ allocation and the potential limitations for women, I think it's important to recall why the MELD score has been beneficial. So it was initially adopted for the purposes of organ allocation in 2002. And as you know, it includes the creatinine, INR, bilirubin, and now sodium as of 2016. And the goal for creating MELD was really, or at least adopting MELD for transplant was to develop an objective measure of disease severity. So trying to put less emphasis on one's time on the transplant wait list with the ultimate goal of reducing overall wait list mortality, which the MELD score did indeed achieve, as well as helping to improve observed uh, racial ethnic disparities in transplant access and rates, which also did in fact improve um, following implementation of MELD. But for women, the MELD score could be better. And over the next 15, 20 minutes or so, we'll talk about some very key features that are important for the ability of women to access and undergo liver transplant 
that are not accurately captured by the MELD. Um, and this includes renal function, body size, and indications etiology for listing. And then in doing so, we'll talk about some specific strategies that we can um, potentially think about for helping to improve organ allocation in women. So the first study that I wanted to um, discuss was published around 2014. And the goal of this was to really figure out, is there a sex difference or a sex-based disparity in access to the transplant list? So is there a difference between men and women getting their foot in the door and actually placed on the wait list? And this study used SRTR data as well as data from the National Center for Healthcare Statistics. And the authors created something called the liver weightlisting ratio, which was essentially a ratio where the numerator is everybody who's listed for transplant divided by um, everybody who's listed plus all the individuals who died of a liver related event who theoretically could have benefit from a liver transplant. And then they subtracted away everybody who actually got a transplant. Now the actual estimate of the liver weightlisting ratio is not as informative. There's plenty of reasons why individuals who die of liver related events are not adequate or appropriate transplant candidates. But the difference in the ratio between men and women is truly what is demonstrative of an existing or how um, the differences that could have been apparent as far as men and women getting to transplant. And surprisingly, women fared just as well as men for both acute liver failure in the pre and post meld period, as well as for individuals who had chronic liver disease. So when we're thinking about disparities, it didn't appear to be that the problem was at this step or getting on the transplant list, but what was happening subsequently after women were actually placed on the wait list. And this is where relying on the MELD in its current form are really causing disadvantage for women who are more likely to die on the wait list, more likely to be delisted as too sick for transplant and then less likely to undergo liver transplant. So one of the first studies, really the Sentinel study to highlight this, this is now published more than 10 years ago in JAMA, looked at individuals who were waitlisted for indications other than um, without MELD exception points. So remember when you get um, MELD exception, it's a distinct pathway that can accelerate your ability to access an organ. So for everybody else, they determined whether there was a sex-based disparity in transplant um, or death or becoming too sick for transplant in men as compared to women following MELD. And indeed, they found that women were about 30% more likely to die on the liver transplant wait list as compared to men. And this is adjusting for all other um, components that we consider to be important, um, such as age, um, obviously not the MELD score, functional status, other parameters. And then the converse was true, which is that if you look at liver transplant rates, women were less likely to undergo a transplant in the post-MELD era as compared to men. And not only that, but this magnitude of difference only got worse or exacerbated following the implementation of MELD, suggesting that at least the introduction of the MELD score for women was only um, causing a worsening of this existing disparity. So this is seen graphically. This was also a study that was published more than 10 years ago. And we know that there was a deficit in transplant rates for women as compared to men. And as you can see, this only got worse following the implementation of the MELD score. And then the important point that they highlighted was that the higher the MELD score, this deficit appeared to just get greater up to about a MELD score of 2029. 20, so populations that were not otherwise able to access organs through prior policies such as SHARE 35, for example. So women who were really needing it the most were experiencing the greatest disparity or the greatest difference in relative transplants as, compa as compared to our male or their male, uh, male counterparts. Now this study was specifically looking at whether there's a difference in men as compared to women for delisting. So here, what they were able to demonstrate is that even adjusting for factors that we know to be associated with the chance of a woman making it to transplant, like height, they also adjusted for MELD score, they also adjusted for um, performance status, women still had about a 10% higher risk of being delisted as being too sick for transplant. So what are some factors that are contributing to these observed sex-based disparities in our waitlist outcomes? 
One of the first and I think most obvious is our reliance on the creatinine for estimating renal function in women. So as we know, creatinine not only estimates kidney function, it also estimates muscle mass and muscle mass is typically greater in men. And one of the early studies looking at renal dysfunction in women, the authors pulled, they compared what the EGFR was for women at the time of listing as compared to men, as well as at last follow-up. And as you can see here, women had a lower EGFR, meaning worse renal function as compared to men, yet this translated into also lower creatinines or seemingly better renal function which in turn translated into women having a listing meld as well as meld at last follow-up that was lower than men. And while a one point difference might not seem that great numerically, they also calculated a mortality ratio. And they found that with adjustment for age, other common parameters, including the meld score, women were much more likely to die on the transplant wait list as compared to men. However, when they then included EGFR into their model, they found that the sex-based disparity in weightless outcomes dissipated. So really highlighting the importance of considering other measures that are more accurate for estimating renal dysfunction in women that could potentially improve the likelihood of them being able to access organs. This was a subsequent study that looked at renal function in men and women and its influence on weightless outcomes. So they reported weightless mortality and liver transplant rates from 2002 to 2013. And this used UNOS data. The authors then also leveraged their own center specific data using a gold standard of iothalamate clearance for estimating true renal um, impairment. And they determined the number of creatinine derived meld points for different ranges of GFR. And what they found was that on average, women were receiving anywhere between 1.2 to 2.4 fewer creatinine derived meld points for, than, than men. And that was for a similar degree of renal dysfunction. They also did some modeling to figure out what would happen with the addition of one meld point for women who are having a creatinine in the range of one to four. And what they found was that approximately 950 more women during this time would have been able to have a meld increase from 34 to 35. So though it sounds numerically small, the incremental increase in meld score, on a broader basis, this would have allowed women to then access organs under share 35. So it would have had a really profound impact on the number of women that would um, subsequently get to transplant. The other important point of this paper is that they were able to demonstrate that the introduction of meld sodium, which again went into effect in 2016, only appeared to exacerbate that underlying disparity. So men are in the black lines, women are in the red lines, meld sodium or the dash lines, traditional meld are in the solid lines. And as you can see for a higher GFR or better renal function, men are starting to accrue exception points um, based on um, renal function at a much higher or better degree of uh, GFR as compared to women. And the sex-based disparity can be as high as a difference of four points in men as compared to women. So at least implementation of the meld sodium doesn't appear to be helping an already existing disparity that happened under our traditional meld system. And the last study or concept I wanna introduce with regards to renal function is a concept called GRAIL or the GFR assessment in liver disease. So GRAIL was developed in a cirrhotic cohort of patients who are listed for liver alone, not listed for SLK. And GRAIL includes age, race, sex, creatinine, bion, and albumin. And the authors have been able to validate this against GFR measured by the gold standard iothalamate clearance. And what they asked was, does the meld grail sodium better predict three-month weightless mortality in both men and women as compared compare to um, our current meld score using meld sodium? And indeed, they found this to be the case. But what was really remarkable is that meld grail sodium was a better predictor of observed mortality as comp compared to just the regular meld sodium for women at the highest deciles of disease severity. So where women are really needing to access these organs. 
So if you look, for example, for a woman who has a MELD score of 32 or greater, her actual mortality is around 67%. Under our current allocation policy with meld sodium, we would estimate her three month mortality rate to be about 55%. Whereas meld grail sodium is, is a much more accurate measure at around 69%. So really introducing the idea that we may need to be thinking to modifications of our current allocation system to come up with strategies that are gonna be better estimators of mortality in women and help them to access organ transplants more readily. Okay, so moving on now to the next um, most obvious factor that contributes to sex-based disparities, that of donor-recipient mismatch. So we know that deceased donors are more often men, and men are oftentimes bigger than women. So a lovely study that was published by Lauren Nephew and her colleagues evaluated whether body surface area is a metric of um, donor-recipient size mismatch was associated with rank position on the transplant list and subsequent organ decline. So they used UNOS match run data from 2007 to 2013. So starting on the left, they looked at all candidates on the wait list. And these are candidates initially without um, HCC meld exception points. And so of these 65,000 individuals, the majority are, when, are men. So we know that a higher proportion of our wait list is made up of men. And there was pretty similar proportion of men and women who were ever ranked in that first position, surprisingly. We begin to start seeing some of these disparities when we look at organ offer decline. It was a bit higher for women at 52% as compared to men at 48%. But where we see the most striking disparity is for those that had an indication of um, donor size recipient mismatch is the reason why their first organ was declined. So this occurred in about 17% of women as compared to only 5% of men. They then performed adjusted analyses to determine what was the likelihood of dying on the wait list with every subsequent organ decline as compared to men who'd had one organ decline as a reference. So as you can see, if you were a woman and you had one organ decline, you had a 26% higher odds of dying on the transplant wait list as compared to a, man, to a man in a similar position. When you start looking at two to four organ declines, men actually didn't have an increased risk of death as compared to men who'd only had one organ decline. Although this marked difference um, in, for women as compared to men was very evident. So 17% higher odds for death of women who have two to four organ declines which is even more marked when you get the five or more organ declines. So what are some strategies that we could think about to address at least the size mismatch that may be contributing to these sex-based disparities in transplant? And one idea is, the, is that of using split livers. So this would really allow increase in the number of individuals who could get transplanted while working with size of organs that would be appropriate for smaller individuals, most of whom end up being women. So I wanna mention something that was called the split liver variance proposal. Now this was a proposal from OPTN liver and intestinal committee. And it was something that was implemented in region eight. So you can kind of see here in the middle of the country um, in December of 2020. And the idea of this proposal was to really incentivize institutions to start splitting livers, such that the first segment would go to a candidate to whom it was originally allocated. That second segment would then be offered to someone in the same region um, who has, who was more origin on the list, either status one or having a meld pelt of 35 plus. And then if there were no individuals who needed it more urgently, it could go back to that local hospital or affiliated hospital. Now, the data kind of looking at how well this has worked since its initial implementation suggests that there hasn't really been an increase in splitting, but it's really challenging, I think, to interpret these data. As you may know, we've kind of gotten rid of DSAs in the regions and focusing now on acuity circles for organ allocation. COVID has certainly impacted our practices for organ allocation. So I think this variance is gonna be reevaluated in the next one to two years to see if we're seeing over time increasing in the use of split livers. So time will tell. Another opportunity is certainly encouraging our female patients to think about 
being donors. And it's interesting because women readily are willing to be donors for others, but they are much less likely than men to be willing to accept a living donor from one of their loved ones. So living donors is something that I right off the bat begin discussing with my female patients at the time of their initial transplant evaluation to really inform them of their higher risk of dying on a wait list and lower likelihood of making it to transplant. And I think it's a hard discussion to have and really hard for especially women to think about putting anyone, any other individuals at risk. Um, and that's really where the role of our living donor programs comes in to be able to help families start thinking through this and understanding what the true risks are. And then I think on a community level, really connecting patients with centers who do living donors if they have potential living donor opportunities available. And the next idea is to potentially think about the use of pediatric organs. So this was a study that had looked at match run data from UNOS from 2010 to 2014. And the authors did a competing risks analysis to figure out the association of your first offer type, meaning were you first offered a pediatric donor or were you first offered an adult donor and how that influenced weightless mortality in men and in women. So for pediatric first offers, they were accepted by a similar proportion of men and women, about 63%. But interestingly, an adult first offer was accepted by the majority of men, 80%, as compared to only 48% of women. So again, highlighting some of the issues that we've discussed before, namely size related, that may preclude women from being able to accept a larger organ. They then performed an adjusted analysis to say, what was the likelihood of dying on the wait list if you were offered a pediatric liver first or an adult liver first as compared to a man who was offered an adult liver first? So if you look at men who are offered a pediatric liver first, their risk of dying on the wait list is no different than if they are a man who is offered an adult liver first. For women, we're seeing a very stable estimate from the prior studies I've showed you where if you look at a woman who's offered an adult liver first as compared to a man, she has about a 33% increased risk of dying on the wait list. Then if you look at women who were offered a pediatric organ first as compared to a man who was offered an adult liver first, that sex-based disparity dissipates. So we're no longer seeing that she has an increased risk of weightless mortality, suggesting that there may be a benefit with preferentially, once organs are declined by a pediatric population, going to smaller individuals and namely women. Importantly, pediatric livers were offered at lower MELD scores. So at least historically nice to think about accessing lower MELD um, livers for lower MELD patients who otherwise weren't pulling livers from our um, prior strategy of SHARE35, for example. And outcomes seem to be just as favorable with peds and adult offers, including liver transplant graft and patient survival. So again, this really opened up the discussion regarding if a pediatric um, donor or liver is not available to go into a pediatric patient in whom I think across the board, everyone agrees pediatric patients should be preferentially prioritized for these, should they then as the next step be preferentially offered to women? Now, some additional factors that may contribute to this sex-based disparity include indication for um, listing for liver transplant. So we know that HCC has a higher prevalence in men, which is traditionally offered a very prioritized pathway for accessing liver transplants. Now, this is going back to Lauren Nephew's original work about organ decline. And she found that without HCC meld exception points, women were less likely to be ranked in that first position as compared to men. She then took that same model and then adjusted for eight, the receipt of HCC meld exception points, as well as body surface area. So accounting for both meld exception as well as potential donor recipient size mismatch. And again, found that that sex-based disparity and weightless mortality went away. Now, this is data that we published more recently that really highlights that even women who do have HCC meld exception points still continue to um, experience a disparity as compared to men. And you can see that in our more traditional wait, least wait time regions, 
um, divided as short, mid, and long. Across the board, women had longer wait times than men. And it appeared that women were most impacted in mid-weight regions. So mid-weight regions have um, traditionally reflected the largest area of the United States with individuals needing liver transplant. So as you can see, women had a higher cumulative incidence of weightless dropout in mid-weight regions and a lower likelihood of actually receiving a liver transplant. Now, the last kind of concept that I wanna introduce that may contribute to observed sex-based differences um, are that of frailty. So this was a study that was um, published by Dr. Lai and colleagues at our institution. And the goal of this study was to determine whether our subjective assessment of a patient's frailty, degree of frailty, which was our eyeball test. So we were each given individual sheets of paper that had a grading system for frailty. And with each of our transplant patients, we had to check off how frail we deem them to be. And so what she found was that as compared to her more objective measures of frailty, something called the liver frailty index that uses grip strength balance and chair stands, at least in this single center study, women did not appear to have greater frailty by objective measures. Yet we, as far as our eyeball test, deem them to be more frail than their male counterparts. So raising um, the possibility that there may be some subjective bias in our evaluation of women that may influence our um, discussions and likelihood to move forward with transplant in our female patients. Now, Dr. Lai's frailty, liver frailty index has been expanded to multi-center study. So this is the most recent data that does include a much larger patient population and now shows clear sex-based differences in true frailty measures, where across the board, grip strength, balance, and chair stands appear to be worse, all the components of the liver frailty index, and women as compared to men. So women do appear to be more frail. And here, this is their adjusted analysis that includes their melt sodium, age, albumin. And what, what she's finding is that same as all the other studies that have come before this, women are more likely to die on the transplant list, have about a 30% increased odds of dying on the transplant list, but that estimate is attenuated when you adjust for liver frailty. And they also conducted a dedicated mediation test and found that approximately 13% of the observed differences, sex-based differences in weightless mortality were attributed to women being more um, frail than men. So really highlighting that this could potentially be an area to do some focused interventions as far as nutrition, um, physical function to help increase the chances that our women or female um, transplant candidates could be gain strength, make it through and thrive through transplant. So I'll stop and summarize here um, to really highlight that there's a lot of reasons why our current meld allocation system is not serving our women well. It's not adequately capturing body size, renal function, disease indications, um, disease etiology. And now, of course, with some policy changes that have gone into effect from the OPTN Liver and Intestinal Committee that have tried to deprioritize HCC and help with these acuity circles to help with geographic disparities, we'll see how some of these observed disparities for individuals listed for HCC translate as far as men and women go um, in subsequent years to come. But I think one um, really important point to mention is that we've long known about these sex-based disparities. Again, the first paper that was published in JAMA was 2008. So we are long overdue to begin making some strategies to improve organ allocation in women. And I think it's coming, again, now that we've kind of focused efforts on addressing geographic disparities, there's something in place called the MELD 3.0. So um, in the works with OPTN, liver and intestinal um, transplant committee to think about some variations to the MELD that could potentially um, address these sex-based disparities. There's the question of whether women should be given an additional you know, point or some um, factor that in, could increase their MELD as compared to men. I think that comes with some challenges of understanding what does it mean to be a woman? And if somebody is identifying as a gender of a female, um, should we be really stepping back to understand the biologic basis for why we're observing these differences? 
and potentially adjust for differences in renal function, as well as size um, mass. There's a course use of split and small, and small livers, as I've mentioned. We'll see how the data play out with the split liver variants, really encouraging on a community basis, referring our patients for living donor evaluation, and the potential to think about use of pediatric livers that are not going to our pediatric population. And then again, introducing the idea that frailty may be playing a role here, and are there some dedicated exercise and nutrition-based interventions that we might be able to do to mitigate those findings. So I'll stop here. I think we'll have some time for some discussions and some questions. Um, thank you, Monica, Dr. Sarkar, for your very insightful um, talk, really highlighting, you know, the six differences that actually exist in um, being able to receive life-saving liver transplant um, in, in women, um, and, you know, pointing out the different factors or variables, why that could be, I certainly have learned a lot personally. I think this definitely would increase awareness of, of all providers. So we'll be moving, uh, to our question and answer session. Um, and I would encourage our participants to, um, go ahead and send us your questions via the chat box. And I'm going to start out with the first question for Dr. Brady. I think, um, you know, you highlighted the fact that women in general have a higher risk of, of progressive uh, liver disease from alcohol, right? A higher risk of having misused behavior and um, outcomes in terms of alcoholic liver disease. So, you know, I have heard from more than one patient that AA or the current, you know, traditional programs actually don't fit them, you know, not to say that AA doesn't work for certain women. So there are many people that actually enjoy AA and have benefited in their women's program or general platform. But I've heard it more than once that the traditional alcohol rehab programs do not necessarily address the multi-variable factors that could be affecting women um, that have alcohol use disorder. What do you think we should push for? Like what should be an ideal program um, and, and helping our patients uh, from alcoholic liver disease recover from? You know, we've been seeing many patients currently, particularly following the pandemic, um, with alcoholic liver disease, mostly women. Um, what do you think we should push for and what should that ideal program be? Um, great question. I don't think there's going to be a one size fits all um, in terms of what's the best program um, for women with this type of disorder. Um, as I highlighted in my slides, there are a lot of different factors that are associated with why these programs either don't work or women are not going to seek these types of therapies. Um, there are family and child care related um, responsibilities that are cited. So you have to be flexible and increase accessibility um, for people who have um, varied types of schedules. Um, so that has to be factored in and considered. Um, you know, the fact that there is a lot of social stigma um, with uh, alcohol use disorder um, is very important. Um, and that has to be looked at as well. So you have to think about programs where um, people are going to feel more comfortable. Not everyone feels comfortable in say an AA setting or a group setting. And maybe the more one-on-one -on -one or individualized um, approach is a better one um, for some patients. So I, I think that you need to think about multiple kinds of ways to reach uh, women with this disorder thinking about all of the different types of factors that are associated with it. Um, you know, for working women, for example, who struggle with, um, you know, work and then, you know, childcare duties, um, something that's scheduled between the traditional eight to five 
clinic hours may not necessarily work for them. Um, and, you know, if they struggle with family duties or childcare duties, then what's the trade off? Is there some opportunity for there to be, um, you know, some type of intervention or, or therapy that comes alongside? you know, childcare um, opportunities as well. You know, these are the kinds of things that have to be thought about. Um, so I don't think it's a one size fits all at all. I, I think that there are multiple different approaches and we have to find ways to fine tune and individualize the therapies. Um, you know, thanks for your comment in, you know, unfortunately, right, most programs that are tailored in that fashion are expensive. Mm -hmm. um, insurance may not cover for for those type of services in the free program that it, you know many people know is is just AA. So I think as a society with increasing number of patients with alcoholic liver disease following particularly the pandemic, now I think we should push for you know a multidisciplinary program tailored to women's need. I know that's a big concept, but um, I think that would be definitely much more helpful um, than demanding our patients to just go to AA. Um, all right, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, there are a couple of questions for you, Monica, and uh, just to echo uh, Kida's thoughts, I, I've learned a lot from both of your talks, actually, um, uh, really tremendous. Thank you both. Um, so we have a um, couple of comments in the chat box um, that I was hoping, Monica, maybe you can comment on. Um, one uh, is from uh, Laura Wynn. Um, she's asking, you know, she's a kidney transplant um, coordinator, uh, clinical research coordinator, and wondering if a lot of these um, sex related um, liver transplant disparities that you highlighted translate to other um, solid organ transplant patients, particularly kidney. Um, and then um, uh, Mignote Yilma, um, aspiring transplant surgeon, as well at UCSF, um, um, is asking, um, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, sex dif differences in liver transplant that you've highlighted. And given how long it's taken to address geographic disparities um, in access to liver transplant, you know, what do you envision it will take to implement some of the changes you discussed? So kind of very, very large um, questions um, for yeah, you to discuss. <laughs> fantastic questions. Mm -hmm. So um, for Laura's question, I will say that there are certainly sex-based disparities as far as kidney transplant. You know, I'm not a transplant nephrologist, but um, I know from my colleagues who do a lot of reproductive health and focus on women, it's been a barrier. And I think um, interesting, one, one thing that has been observed in the kidney transplant literature, more so than the liver transplant literature is also um, sex disparity and referral to transplant. So that's really where we're seeing differences in actually getting on to the kidney transplant wait list um, to be more apparent. So that's a challenge that we don't see um, as obviously in the liver transplant world. There's different, you know, the allocation system is very different for kidney than it is for women. I mean, than it is for um, liver, but I think that there's their own unique challenges with the physiology and we're still, you know, battling the, the um, trying to come up with measures that are best, ac you know, most accurately reflecting what a woman's true renal dysfunction is. So yes, sex-based disparities we're seeing across, certainly across kidney transplants as well as liver transplant. We just have a very unique um, organ allocation process that's dependent upon MELD score, which is not present in um, for kidney transplant allocation. And so that's where we have really seen that our current policies are not serving women well. And I think, you know, think about Mignote's question. I think it's soon. Um, and I never thought that I would say soon because <laughs> we've been talking about about this for so long, but truly there have already been um, two meetings with the liver intestinal um, liver and intestinal committee from OPTN and they're, you know, taking feedback. And so there is a dedicated task force that is actively working on MELD 3.0. So I don't think it's going to be much longer um, before we start to see at least implementation in, in some level of some of these policies. And, you know, I think, for example, the split 
variance proposal was meant to do so. The split variance proposal was really meant to try to increase the access of organs to women. And it was something that did go into effect in, initially in region eight. Um, and so we've seen incremental, you know, stepwise changes to start uh, modifying these policies. But I think now that the geographic disparity has really been addressed, I think the attention is now turning to these sex-based disparities for organ allocation with liver. And we've already seen that with dedicated committees who are actively working on MELD 3.0. Monica, to kind of follow up on that, what do you think that ideal formula should be that would be addressing? I mean, you definitely have highlighted multiple variables that are key. Is it going to be all of them or what are they working on? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, it hasn't been decided yet whether it's going to be a factor based on, is it going to be replacing creatinine with a more accurate measure of renal dysfunction, such as GFR? Will there concurrently be some component that will additionally address size? Um, and we know that men who are short are also disadvantaged. So the size issue isn't uniquely affecting women, but addressing size alone doesn't fix the problem. Addressing mm -hmm. GFR alone doesn't fix the problem. So it, it's probably going to have to be a multifaceted model. And I think there's something called LSAM, where it's a simulated modeling um, that is going to be kind of undertaken to start looking at what's the best formula. You know, it's not going to be something that we can quickly calculate on our fingers, mm -hmm. um, but it's going to need to be a little bit more robust to account for the nuances of organ allocation to address these disparities. Thank you. I have a question for both of you. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Brady, uh, you had um, highlighted that uh, there seems to be more progression of liver disease in postmenopausal women and kind of worse outcomes. Um, have there been, and, and that perhaps uh, some women who were on hormone replacement therapy had better outcomes. Um, is that something that is being applied, you know, currently in taking care of women with liver disease? Are you guys each, you know, thinking about whether you should put your women on, uh, your postmenopausal women on hormone replacement therapy, um, or are we not, not to that um, level yet? I, I think that that's a, a great question. Um, and probably a complicated one. Um, as most are um, quite aware, there's been a lot of controversy about hormone therapy over the years in terms of what's beneficial and what incurs greater risk. So we find it beneficial in um, many disorders, but we also know that it's associated with increased risk for thromboembolic disease, stroke, breast cancer, gallbladder disease, and you know, a number of things that um, could potentially um, you know, be of detriment to a woman's health. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about whether or not it's been associated with increased cardiovascular risk. Um, and there's some data, earlier data to suggest that it has been. Um, more recent data suggests maybe not quite so for every population. Um, of women who are um, postmenopausal, um, meaning that particularly for younger women who are postmenopausal, that um, association with increased cardiovascular risk might not be there. So I think that it's a complicated question simply because of the, the challenges with hormone therapy inherently itself in terms of benefits versus risks. So I don't think that we're quite there in terms of being able to apply this to liver disease specifically. And I think that it requires an individualized discussion of risk and benefits globally between providers and patients. That's Monica, super helpful. Have... Monica, what are your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Carla. It's it's challenging, but it has to be tailored. And I think one of our other jobs is really to inform patients that they can safely be on hormone replacement therapy with many forms of liver disease. So on the flip side is if their doctors feel that they have an indication for being on hormone replacement therapy and in many types of different um, conditions with chronic liver 
safe for them to, to use that therapy. So a lot of times I think um, clinicians are leery to allow our from when we're talking about contraceptive based hormones to HRT. Um, and, you know, it's certainly we get we're more concerned when we're starting to think about patients who progress onto cirrhosis, certainly decompensated cirrhosis, where we're quite concerned about um, putting, allowing them to be kind of exposed to any more exogenous hormones. But for many of our patient population, um, or for many of our patients, it's, it's a safe um, treatment regimen for them to be taking. And so if they have other medical indications for being on that, um, to really make sure that we're having a good conversation between us and their provider, whoever it is, is a primary care provider, endocrinologist, um, to really encourage them to not withhold therapies that they would otherwise um, be receiving just simply because they have liver disease. One thing I would um, also add is that I think that this highlights the importance of being very aggressive with liver disease management, um, particularly when we think about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I showed you a lot of data about how some of what we see earlier in a woman's life can be predictive of what may happen later on in life. And so for many of my patients who are still of childbearing age, who um, you know haven't quite yet achieved menopause, I'm very aggressive in conversations with them about making sure that they are really focusing in on their metabolic health. Um, you know, getting weight under control, really thinking about their um, glycemic control, their lipid status, um, their control of blood pressure, and doing that very aggressively and very early on so that they're not walking into um, their, you know, uh, premenopausal um, and you know menopausal years um, already with that level of metabolic disarray that puts them at greater risk for worse liver disease. I, I think it's just extremely important to be thoughtful about targeting that population with aggressive interventions early on. Fantastic, fantastic, and actually that that brings up a good point, which is you know. Um, Again, many questions I have just from my, even my own practice um, and, and seeing women with liver disease. Uh, I'd love to pick your brains, but that could go on for hours and hours. But I think one question I had, um, and, and both of you may comment as well, is, uh, you know, what are types of referrals you're seeing for kind of women's related um, um, issues in liver disease? I know, Monica, you, you, you run a, a women's clinic. Um, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm not sure if you, Carla, uh, similarly, but I'm sure you get referred, you know, a lot of patients, um, you know, what are the kind of cases you're seeing? What are um, cases that really should have uh, this kind of focused intervention um, and um, kind of specialty referral um, to folks like you who are experts in this, in this area? Yeah, I can start with this. I think, um... Luckily, I think there's gaining greater recognition about the importance of reproductive health on chronic liver disease and the intersection of the two. Um, many of the patients I see with fatty liver, you know, as Carla mentioned, um, we really focus on trying to get some of these metabolic parameters under control now because we're seeing the implications of these diseases down the road and how quickly. So we know, you know, NASH progression is more rapid in women and it's now the leading indication for liver transplant in women. So I see a lot of reproductive age women. My focus on PCOS, I certainly see a lot of them in my, my clinic. And I do counsel them because we, we have data that they tend to have more aggressive disease at earlier age. So we see a lot of these patients who have kind of metabolic derangements in the context of PCOS, um, but just young women with NAFLD. And I think, you know, in a combination of alcoholic related disease on top of NAFLD, we know that when women are obese, they're also not tolerating the same quantities of alcohol. It seems to be a, a smaller amount that's causing more progression when they have concurrent processes going on. 
So it's really this young population that I think um, are flooding our patient panel and that are then going to be ending up on our transplant wait list at much younger ages than they should be. So of course, you know, pregnancy in the context of any chronic liver disease, I think is important to connect with a provider who has um, interest or expertise in that area. But I think really also focusing on a population that might just be managed in a primary care clinic and not really get connected with a hepatologist to start assessing the severity of steatosis, fibrosis, um, and potential need for liver biopsy, depending on kind of the severity of their liver markers and what we're detecting on non-invasive imaging, so that they can really understand what their prognosis is and the dire need to start making interventions now. And for a lot of people, they just, that doesn't click until they recognize that there's something wrong with their liver. I think people really understand that it's truly a vital organ. Um, but just lose weight, lose weight, you know, get your diabetes under control. Sometimes it just sounds like a broken record in the primary care setting. And sometimes it's a broken record coming from us from NAFL. But I think people understanding the damage that's happening to, to their liver can really be a motivating factor for them to begin making change. Monica, to follow up on that, at your program at UC, do you have kind of a multidisciplinary provider network that's helping you manage your patients yeah in we, addition to hepatology clinic we are starting so for um for my pcos patients we have a multidisciplinary clinic here so that they're able to get kind of top to bottom discussions of all the different aspects that are affecting their health. And I'm part of that on the liver context, but we have a dedicated nutritionist for our NAFL patients who we connect them with. There's a, um, a weight management clinic at UCSF. So we also connect our patients there. We have a very active bariatric surgery program. So we're seeing more and more of our younger patients going forward with bariatric surgery. So I think it does take a holistic approach. I would really love if we had more on kind of the um, more just support on kind of the psychosocial end, because I think it, it takes such a toll. And for a lot of people, it's very hard to kind of work with the overwhelmed stress and anxiety that's just happening in the day-to-day -day life, where food is an addiction, just like alcohol is an addiction. And I think it really, um, I wish that there was more insurance coverage and better um, kind of coverage for therapy on that end and kind of the psychosocial realm in addition to what we're offering on the quote unquote medical um, realm that would allow patients to have more sustained changes um, in a holistic way. And so I think that's one thing that we are lacking, um, yeah, that we need. I'm not sure, um, Carla, what you have there at Duke. Yes, we, we certainly have a multidisciplinary approach to um, a very active bariatric program, um, very active fatty liver disease program. Uh, we also have a dedicated nutritionist that works with our fatty liver patients and actually um, more broadly with our liver disease patients. Um, and that's, you know, quite helpful. Um, you need a, a good nutritionist to help with fatty liver disease management. Um, but when we think about, say, for example, our cirrhosis patients, our patients who are frail with their liver disease, and the fact that they have protein calorie bell nutrition, that's where you also need a good dietitian. Um, so we um, are, I think, building much more aggressive um, nutrition support to help our liver disease patients. Um, in regards to other patients that I see, um, I see a good number of patients with um, hepatitis C. So reflecting back to some of the data that I showed you where, um, you know, we seem to have had a market increase in the number of women with acute hepatitis C. So these are women who are becoming exposed to hepatitis C infection um, in their childbearing years. Um, I see a, a number of referrals from my obstetric colleagues um, who are very aggressive about um, hepatitis C screening in their population and getting those patients into my clinic. And even though I may not be treating their hepatitis C while they're pregnant, being able to get them into clinic where they're actively engaged during the time of pregnancy, um, actively engaged in their own health care, um, and really wanting to you know, do the best and, and partake of what the healthcare system has to offer, I think that's the perfect time to provide um, education. Um, and to you know, capture as many of those women as possible so that once pregnancy is complete, um, we can 
very quickly treat their hepatitis C um, and prevent these women from moving on to advanced fibrosis in their later years because of missed opportunities for treatment. Um, so, you know, that's also um, a, a passion of mine. And, and I have welcomed every single referral and have told my MFM colleagues, uh, maternal fetal medicine colleagues, that even though I may not do anything right at the moment while they're pregnant, I want them in my clinic because I want to take that opportunity to educate them and then be able to hold on to them immediately postpartum so we could aggressively treat their hepatitis C. That's fantastic and uh, super helpful. Um, uh, Mignote in the chat also um, asks, um, we made a distinction between sex and gender. Um, and you know, if we look at gender, um, are there differences in liver transplant referral um, evaluation outcomes? Um, have there been studies looking at that, um, Dr. Brady or, or Dr. Sarkar, either of you? Yeah, so the studies I had shown earlier really didn't find a difference in actually getting our um, female patients on the transplant list when we're thinking about um, gender and referrals. I think we have, there have been some data, especially in kind of the kidney transplant. Join the meeting. Have really demonstrated that difference. So um, certainly a bias in getting women referred for kidney transplants. I think the other, you know, and I was mentioning the subjective data, mm -hmm. frailty, it's very interesting how we may... Um, perceive women as compared to men when it comes to their their mm -hmm. strength, um, which is something, you know, more on the spectrum of gender. But I think a lot of the differences that are challenging with the meld organ and allocation system really relate to biologic difference that are more sex-based. So when we're thinking about the liver volume itself um, for appropriately size matching um, estimators of renal dysfunction when we're thinking about GFR versus creatinine that's going to account for some muscle mass as well and underestimate true renal function in women. These are more biological, um, biologic basis for existing disparities. Carla, anything to add to that? No, I, I think I would agree um, that there's a lot of focus on the biological issues um, that are associated with this. And I, I think that's where the focus has to be in order to achieve improvement um, and uh, hopefully provide uh, a more equal um, uh, outcomes in terms of women um, becoming transplanted um, and eliminate the disparity that Monica so nicely um, talked about during her presentation. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Um, I guess in, in the remaining minutes, I would, I would love to hear from each of you. You know, you've, you've shared um, some of the tremendous work you're each doing at your respective institutions, um, uh, both of whom are, are lucky to have you guys as experts and resources for patients. Um, are there programs at other institutions that you've uh, heard about that address kind of disparities in women's health that you feel like are um, really remarkable and, and that, you know, other institutions should, should perhaps try to emulate? I don't know if it's really, you know, an institution-based um, process, but again, as I was mentioning some of the changes that we're going to see on more of a national level, I think that's where I feel the most optimistic is to start to see some of these adjustments to our meld allocation system. So I think there's reason to believe that this is going to happen soon. Um, and I think all the right people are looking into this and starting to think about what's the most appropriate model, which fortunately will um, really affect change across all of our institutions and not be something where we're seeing disparity just based on what center um, you're fortunate to attend. So Monica, to Zeta's actually a very important question pertaining to that from Joanne from PSC Partners, who has done a lot of advocacy for PSC at different stages, including, um, you know, you know, say an FDA. So one of her questions here uh, was, has anybody, is anyone doing any advocacy at you know, or OPTN to promote that allocation system change? Would that be helpful? 
Yes, I think there's been a lot of advocacy um, across the board that's really um, helped to make this even go into effect, these meetings that have already taken place. Um, you know, you can see if you go to OPTN, you can see the minutes and the different, um, the input and the different suggestions that have come through. So I think that really required a lot of adv advocacy to get here. Um, so it's been a long time coming, but again, I think to leave on really an optimistic note that I think we're gonna be seeing changes in the um, not too far future. Fantastic, and Carla, did you have any, any programs or initiatives you wanted to highlight? Um, I, I think like, as Monica mentioned, um, I think there's more conversation on a broader level. Um, if you just look even at sort of the bird's eye view of literature published um, in the liver disease realm, you'll see a lot more that focuses in on um, women's health related issues with liver disease, um, liver disease in reproductive aged women, um, liver disease in postmenopausal women. I think there's a lot of increased awareness about this. Um, increased awareness about um, the role of estrogen in liver disease, increased awareness about these gender, dispar gender and sex-based disparities that we are seeing. Um, and it's my hope that as we hopefully continue to flood the research realm um, with more and more data, that that will um, allow for a, a broader um, implementation of liver disease management that really looks at things with a more diverse lens and really takes into account these um, sex and gender differences that we see. Um, let me see. To kind of add to both of your comments as the previous member of the Women's Initiative Committee at ASLD, Monica, I think we've done a great work in that group and we should promote engagement by everyone. You know, the ASLD guide us, guidance document came from that. Um, we were able to host right the first women's uh, liver disease at the main ASLD platform. That used to not be the case. And we have an upcoming now, right, single topic conference in women health. So I think Monica's chairing that committee now. We should definitely promote engagement of our providers because I think that group is going to definitely promote um, awareness, research, education, and at the end of the day, increase um, or improve cares that we provide for all women liver liver patients. Um, any comment on that, Monica? Yeah, I think it's it, the ASLD has really um, put a focus, a spotlight on women's health, and I think over the past three years, we've seen a lot of progress. And um, yeah, Kittis, you've worked so hard when, on the committee too, and. You know, we have, as those of you may or may not know, we have the reproductive um, guidance document that came out in the fall of this past year. So it was inaugural guidance to kind of inform uh, practitioners on how to manage different reproductive health related conditions um, across the spectrum of both liver disease. This year, there'll be a dedicated uh, reproductive health session, so abstract session, um, parallel session, which has never been, has never occurred at ASLD before in the past. And this will be the third year of having a dedicated women's reproductive health session um, in addition. So invited speakers for that topic. So I think there's been so much more work and a lot of opportunities for people to really gain additional education and think about where they want to fo focus the research efforts. So I think it's great to think about mentees who are coming along and really interested in developing a niche in this area because there remain so many questions that are unanswered. And I think on um, the educational level, attending these forums, these programs, you can see where we need more information and start to really dedicate that effort. And I think knowing that you've got um, the backing of big organizations um, that really recognize that this now needs to come to the forefront. Any more questions to, from our attendees? Okay, so I think we should um, wrap up. I am really, really grateful for our speakers today. I think you're highlighted a very important, right? 
um, topic and, and disparities that exist based on sex and, and, and women health uh, pertaining to liver disease. I've learned a lot. Um, I think there were many things that were highlighted, um, increasing our awareness, and hopefully that will promote research in implementing things that actually will improve care at the end of the day. And thank you, Bells, for taking your time for um, teaching us today. Um, and I'm also grateful for ASLD for, I'm sorry, for ALF uh, hosting us um, in promoting this um, education. And thanks for our, our attendees um, for joining us at late hours um, and for the very interesting questions and discussions that you all contributed contributor to. Uh, thank you, everyone. Nazar, any comment? That yeah, I just want to echo um, your sentiments. Thank you so much um, to Dr. Brady and Dr. Sarkar. Really tremendous talks. I've learned so much and again, highlights some of the kind of underlying selfish reasons I wanted to have this um, enrichment series <laughs> is to really further my own learning in this area mm -hmm. of interest. And so uh, thank you both. It was tremendous. Thank you to doctors um, Jennifer Guy and Courtney Sherman for really championing this cause as well and really encouraging our MAC to move um, to move forward with these um, seminars. Um, and then thank you, of course, to uh, Jackie Dominguez from the American Liver Foundation and our sponsors um, for helping us put this together. We have a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Um, and of course, we'd welcome you, um, Carla, and any colleagues um, from the East Coast to join. Uh, but we have um, academic debates, a poster competition, um, um, and there are you know, tremendous um, resources available on the American Liver Foundation website for patients and providers. Um, uh, and for people who are interested in health disparities, um, research and, and um, advocacy, patient advocacy. Um, so thank you all for joining and I hope you all have a fantastic summer and beyond. Thank you, everyone. Have, have a great evening. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.